The next special test for the meniscus is McMurray's test. And McMurray's test is really two separate tests. There's one to test for injuries to the medial menisci and a separate one for the lateral menisci. We're gonna begin by looking at McMurray's test for medial menisci. And to perform this test, the patient will be positioned in supine, as you see right here with their test side knee, in this case, the right side in flexion. Now the PT, which is me, will firmly grasp the patient's tibia, that is the distal tibia, proximal to the ankle with one hand, and apply the following forces with the following movement. So the forces are gonna be tibial external rotation. I'm gonna be applying that with my right hand here at the distal tibia. And then I'm also gonna apply a valgus force to the knee. So the valgus force is gonna be coming from the outside, pushing in toward her midline. And then while maintaining those forces, I'm gonna move her into knee extension. So let's take a look at that. So I'm gonna lift the leg up, First, you'll see the external rotation. There's tibial external rotation. And then with my left hand here, I'm gonna apply the valgus force to the knee joint line. And while maintaining those, I'm gonna move her through passive range of motion of the knee, really towards full knee extension. Obviously, at some point, I've gotta go back to flexion. But this is McMurray's test for the medial meniscus. Let's get another view of this. So with my right hand there, I'm gonna apply an external rotation force. There it is. And then with my left hand, the valgus force to the knee, and while maintaining both of those, move her toward knee extension. Now, a negative test is going to be painless, and that would potentially indicate a healthy medial meniscus. And a positive McMurray's test here is going to be indicated by reproduction of the patient's familiar pain. Now, this particular test is for an injury to the medial meniscus. So if we reproduce the patient's pain, where will we expect to find it? Is it gonna be on the lateral joint line or the medial joint line? Well, it's for the medial meniscus, so if we reproduce the pain, it should be expected to be at the medial joint line of that knee. And there may also be clicking, popping, other things indicating a tear of the meniscus. Okay. Let's take one more look at McMurray's test for the medial meniscus. So we elevate the leg, inflection, external rotation of the tibia, valgus force to the knee, and then we move them into knee extension. We're now gonna look at McMurray's test for the lateral menisci. When we tested the medial menisci, the forces applied to the knee were tibial external rotation and a valgus force. So to test for an injury to the lateral menisci, those forces will now be opposite. So the forces will now be combined tibial internal rotation and a varus force to the knee. And recall that a varus force is gonna be directed at the medial aspect of the knee here, outward laterally. So basically it'll be from her midline toward me as the examiner, okay? And again, we're going to then move her knee into knee extension from a position of flexion. So it starts off very similarly. We pick up the patient's leg and we bring it into flexion. And you'll notice that I'm bracing the patient's leg against my abdomen. I could brace it against my torso or my abdomen. And that's gonna make it easier to apply the varus force from this position, okay? So first we're gonna apply tibial internal rotation. There's internal rotation. There's the varus force. And then from here, I'm gonna move her knee into knee extension. Now, a negative test would, of course, be painless. A positive test will be indicated by reproduction of the patient's familiar pain. And as we talked about in the other McMurray test for the medial meniscus, if we are to reproduce the patient's pain, that pain location should be consistent with which meniscus has the injury. So, if the patient has a lateral meniscus tear, and this is a positive test for pain, the pain would be reproduced on the lateral aspect of the knee at the lateral joint line. And again, there may be possible clicking, popping, and other phenomena associated with a tear to the meniscus. Here's another view of this test. So we're bracing the patient's leg against our abdomen or torso, depending on your height and the table height. We're then going to apply an internal rotation force to the tibia, right there, and then a varus force to the knee, and then we move them into knee extension while maintaining both of those forces.
So generally for McMurray's test, you can see up here the psychometric values. Sensitivity is 70% and specificity is 71%. So it's not great as a standalone test. You can't be absolutely sure that if it's positive, the person has a meniscus tear. However, remember that with these tests, even though as standalone tests they're not great, you should see the results corroborated by the other meniscus special tests. So if somebody has a positive McMurray's test, it's likely that one of the other tests will also be positive, whether it's Apley's compression test, or Thessaly's test, or Steinman's test, which we haven't seen yet. And now, the final meniscus special test we're going to be looking at is Steinman's test, and there's two parts. Here's part one. We'll be looking at part two in just a minute. And the fact that there's two parts to this that both are Steinman's tests is kind of a misnomer. It seems to imply that part two is dependent on the result of part one and that it's just one special test. That's not the case at all. These can be thought of as two different special tests. They just both happen to bear Steinman's name. Okay? So to perform Steinman's test part one, the patient will be positioned in supine or supine hook lying, as you see right here, with the test side knee bent to 90 degrees. The exact position really doesn't matter. Uh, the patient can have the other leg bent up, which would be technically hook lying. It can be down like this. The patient can even be sitting over the edge of the table in short sitting. The whole thing here is that the test side knee needs to be bent to 90 degrees, okay? So with the test side knee bent to 90 degrees of flexion, the PT will firmly grasp the patient's tibia, so basically the distal tibia down here proximal to the ankle, and they will apply an internal rotation and then an external rotation force to the tibia. So let's take a look at that. And I usually choose to stabilize the femur right here with my other hand. There's the internal rotation force. There's the external rotation force right there. And you're really just assessing for patient's report of pain and also clicking and popping and so on and so forth. Obviously, a negative test would be painless. And then a positive test here would be indicated by reproduction of the patient's familiar pain. And again, depending on whether there's an injury to the medial or lateral meniscus, that would also be consistent with where their pain is. If it is a lateral meniscus tear, you would expect the pain to be on the lateral aspect of the knee at the lateral joint line. Okay? And a few other modifications that depend on PT preference. Here I have the foot planted on the table. This is certainly one way that you can do this. You can also slightly elevate the foot off of the table, so technically you're in total open chain and perform the same thing, internal rotation and external rotation. And you can also have the patient sit off the edge of the table with their foot just dangling over the edge in short sitting. And you can apply the internal rotation and external rotation force in that position. Okay? And with Steinman's test part one, you can see the sensitivity and specificity are pretty good. Sensitivity is 97% and the specificity is 87%. So if Steinman's test part one is positive, there's an 87% chance that they do have a tear to the meniscus. And if this test is negative, there's a 97% chance that they do not have an injury to the meniscus. So that is Steinman's test part one. So firmly grasp the patient's tibia proximal to the ankle and apply an internal rotation force and an external rotation force. And finally, we get to Steinman's test part two. So in your mind, separate this from Steinman's test part one. They are very different in how they're performed. They're very different in what constitutes a positive test and also different in the reason why you perform them, okay? So when somebody comes in with a meniscus injury, where do they usually have pain? They usually have pain at the lateral joint line or the medial joint line. That is a hallmark of a meniscus injury. And if somebody has that presentation, especially if there's combined swelling and a rotational mechanism of injury, you definitely need to look for the possibility of a meniscus injury. But let's suppose the person doesn't have medial joint line pain. They don't have lateral joint line pain. Instead, they have anterior knee pain. So what is the most common cause of anterior knee pain? It's patellofemoral pain syndrome. Could be an issue with the patella, like a tracking issue. It could be patellar instability. 
It could be a cartilage tear underneath the patella within the joint space. It could be quadricep tightness, weakness, et cetera, et cetera. Those are usually the things that come to mind. What usually doesn't come to mind is a meniscus tear. But what if that meniscus tear is of the anterior horn of the meniscus? Well, then it would probably present with a more anterior knee pain presentation. And so that would be a case where you'd use Steinman's test part two, where there's anterior knee pain, but it doesn't really look like patellofemoral pain syndrome. So you might do this test. You'll see why in a minute, but this test is also known as Steinman's tenderness displacement test. And this has to do with how you interpret a positive result. Okay, So how do you perform this? The patient will be in supine hook line or supine, depending on how you're looking at this, with the test side knee bent as you see right here. It doesn't have to be bent all the way to 90 degrees, it just needs to be in some degree of flexion. Okay? The PT will firmly palpate the knee's joint line, either medial or lateral. So you're going to test both of them, and in this video I'm going to show you the lateral aspect. The place you're going to palpate with your thumb, as you see right here, is really a space that's bounded by the femoral condyle, the tibial condyle, and the patella. So there's a space in there, and you should find it on yourself as you're watching this video. That is, for the lateral joint line here, it would be bounded by the lateral aspect of the patella, the lateral femoral condyle, and the lateral tibial condyle of the tibial plateau. That space right there, if you push hard enough, that's where you would indirectly feel the anterior horn of the meniscus. So to perform this test, the patient will be positioned in supine or supine hook line. Technically, it's not full supine hook line because the knee does not need to be bent all the way to 90 degrees. It just needs to be bent to some extent. Usually 30 to 45 degrees is a good estimate of where you should start. The PT will firmly palpate the knee's joint line. You're gonna do both medial and lateral, but you're gonna do it one at a time. We're starting here with the lateral joint line. And the place that you wanna palpate there is at a space bounded by the patella, the femoral condyle, and the tibial condyle. That space right there, if you push hard enough, you're gonna hit the anterior horn of the meniscus, okay? So with my thumb there again, I'm on the lateral joint line of the knee for this video. I'm bounded here by the lateral aspect of the patella, the inferior aspect of the lateral femoral condyle, and the superior aspect of the lateral tibial condyle. That space there, that's where I'm firmly pressing. From there, I'm actually gonna put my other thumb on top of that and really push down in there so that I can hit that anterior horn of the meniscus, okay? And I'm going to assess for pain here while in this flexed position. I'm then going to repeat the same thing in a fully extended position. I might need to slightly reposition the thumb because, again, the bones are shifting, so that space may shift as you go from flexion to extension. But again, I'm repeating the same thing in extension. Okay. Now, we'll talk about a positive test in just a minute. But understand that between the flex position and the extended position, that tenderness or that pain will shift if this is a positive test. In general, if the tenderness or pain is more posterior in the flexed position and more anterior in the extended position, that would constitute a positive Steinman's test part two. And because that pain or that tenderness shifts depending on whether the knee is flexed or extended, that's why this is called Steinman's tenderness displacement test because the, the pain or tenderness is actually displacing. What you can also do is you can perform the same test but maintain that pressure on the anterior horn and then while you're maintaining that, passively move the knee into extension. So again, in this position of knee flexion, the pain should be a little bit more posterior. And as I passively move the knee into extension, it should shift anteriorly. Okay? Conversely, as I move it back into the flex position, the tenderness or pain should shift back to being more posterior. So I'm going to move back to flexion. It should shift more posterior there and now back to anterior. So depending on the knee position, the location of the pain or tenderness displaces. And if these things are true right here, 
That is a positive Steinman's test part two. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.